Now, let's take a look at the evidences for evolution. Now, this is not going to be an exhaustive list at all, and we're really only looking at biological evidence. But you can find evidence from just about any science you choose to look at. All right? So the first evidence that we're going to talk about is from the fossil record. So the fossil record is the ordered array in which the fossils appear in layers. So, you know, this is just showing uh, various fossils here. So, you know, so this is a trilobite. Here's a, you know, fossilized leaf. Oh, the, uh, you know, insect in amber made famous by Jurassic Park. And no, you can't get DNA out of it. It's all gone. So, uh, oh, this is Utsi. Utsi uh, was uh, a guy who was found in the, uh, I believe it was the Italian Alps or Swiss Alps. Uh, he died about 5,000 years ago and was discovered uh, on a, a hiking trip by a couple of people. Uh, so kind of interesting story about him. Uh, he was uh, actually murdered. Uh, they found a, an arrowhead in his back, but they also found other blood types on the front of him. So he was in a fight with people. So anyway, so the fossil record follows the principle of superposition. The principle of superposition states that the lower rocks are older than the ones above it. And that's because as new sediment is laid down, it's laid down on top. And if the earth gets shifted over time and erosion processes occur, then those layers get exposed. Definitely like what we see in the Grand Canyon. All right. So, and what happens here is we go down deeper in here, we find older fossils as we find older rocks. What's also nice about the fossil record is that we find entire lineages of organisms. So this is looking at the horse lineage, starting off with Hyracotherium, which this little guy uh, was uh, the size of a mid-sized dog, uh, four-toed. And what happened with these guys is that where they were living, uh, they lived in kind of a rainforest environment. So they were small and nimble. And what happened over time is that rainforest dried up and became prairies. And what you see with horse evolution is they became larger to avoid predation. And they also lengthened their limbs to increase their speed. They don't need to be agile anymore in an open plain. All right. Uh, so just another slide of that. Um, this is showing uh, humans and our cranium size increased over time. Um, so uh, we have a pretty good fossil record uh, for whales as well. Most of this was done in the uh, ninth, late 80s, early 1990s uh, in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And as you can imagine, uh, we're not doing as much fossil exploring there recently. All right, so once again with whales there. So this is showing Archaeopteryx. Now Archaeopteryx is what we call transitional species shows characteristics of two major groups of organisms. So Archaeopteryx, and this is a cartoon version of it, showed uh, traits between uh, reptiles and, uh, I'm sorry, dinosaurs and modern day birds in that it had feathers for flight uh, like modern day birds. It actually had hollow bones, which you can't see, uh, but that's a uh, characteristic modern birds have. But it has some characteristics that no modern bird has today. It has claws on its wings. No modern bird has that. It had teeth. Uh, no modern bird had that. It has vertebrae in its tail. Uh, no modern bird has that as well. They might have tail feathers, but they don't have bones in that tail. All right. What's interesting about the teeth, though, is that birds will have teeth in their embryological stages, but they lose them before they hatch. So. This is also showing another transitional organism called Tiktaalik. And it's a transition between these lobe fin fishes, which have fleshy fins, bones in their fins, not the typical fish that we see. Some of these guys are around today. And er so Tiktaalik was a, a transition between these lobe fin fishes and early amphibians. All right. So another group of evidence is known as uh, biogeography. And this is a geographical distribution of species. Essentially what we're saying here is an uh, a organism, a species originates in one area and then it'll spread out to other areas. And so when we see 
uh, organisms that are uh, closely related to each other, they're typically closer to each other geographically. And this is actually what we see with those Galapagos Island finches. They are more closely related to each other than they are to any other finches on the planet. And they are also more closely related to South American finches than they are to any other species on the planet, which is what you would expect through evolutionary processes, not if organisms were thrown around the globe willy-nilly. All right? Biogeography also corresponds with the fossil record. So, you know, uh, we can see the movement of organisms throughout the planet. And it also corresponds to plate tectonics. So this is showing plate tectonics. So here, these plates are on the planet, right, are on the surface of the Earth, the crust. And that crust, those plates are constantly moving. Right? And these arrows are showing these movements. And wherever we have one plate hitting against another plate, one plate goes down, the other one gets pushed up. That's where we see mountains start to show. But we're also going to see a lot of volcanic activity and earthquakes where these plates come into contact with each other. Now, if we go back in time, what we can see is that all the continents were together in this large mega continent known as Pangaea. And over time, these continents have slowly moved apart from each other. And so what this does then is this allows us to understand how some organisms are in some areas and how they're not in other areas. So if we go back 130 million years ago and this time period here, this is where mammals started to evolve, but still dinosaurs were around, all right? And so what you had were different kinds of mammals, marsupials, and monotremes, and placental mammals. Now, most mammals today are placental. Where do we find marsupials, like kangaroos and koalas? Well, they're over here in Australia. And as you can see, Australia split off from the rest of the globe millions of years ago. So when placental mammals dominated in the rest of these continents, they couldn't get to Australia because Australia was separated by an ocean, all right? In fact, when humans first got to Australia, the only placental mammals there were bats because they could fly there, all right? So next, let's look at artificial selection. Artificial selection uh, is the selective breeding of plants and animals to promote the occurrence of desirable traits in the offsprings, all right? So this is showing a wild mustard plant. And that wild mustard plant has been selectively uh, altered into, you can see, kale, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, broccoli, kohlrabi. What's not listed is cabbage. So all of those, no, I did say cabbage, uh, cauliflower, sorry. Cauliflower is also in this group, all right? All those originally came from the wild mustard. So these were selectively bred. And why Darwin spent a lot of time looking at artificial selection was that it shows that species can be modified. And he thought if species can be modified uh, by humans, then they can definitely be modified by the environment. Next is comparative anatomy. Oh, sorry, sorry. this is showing uh, ancestral corn, modern corn through selective breeding. Uh, here's an old watermelon, corn even further back, bananas having seeds. Here's eggplants. Eggplants actually used to be white, uh, so this is even further along, right? That's why they're called eggplants, because they were white. Carrot, and then we can see there's the wild mustard as well, all right? So, next is comparative anatomy. This is a comparison of body structures in different species. So the first are, is homologous structures. These are structures that are similar in different species of common ancestry. So these are showing a modification off of previous common ancestor. And one example of this are these, uh, the, uh, uh, the embryological stages that we see with vertebrates, all right? As you can see here, they all have gill pouches and a bony tail. Hey, there's us. We have gill pouches and a, uh, and a tail. So you can see how similar these embryos are, right? And then these structures become other things in us. Obviously with us, our tail gets reduced, but those gill pouches uh, become other things like our uh, inner ear cavity, our eustachian tube. But for some of us, those gill pouches uh, don't fully close. And you'll see on some people this little hole right there, and this is called a preauricular sinus. 
And that's a remnant of these gilt pouches not fully closing in a you know, human, or you can find them in other organisms. Not the shark though, because those gilt pouches become their gills. All right, so this ear, well, is mine. So, and I have that, you know, I didn't fully develop apparently. And so you can still see that pre-auricular sinus in me. All right, another place that we see homologous structures is the vertebrate forelimb. So what we see in the vertebrate forelimb is this one bone, two, uh, two bones, uh, lots of bones, and then digits, all right? Now we see modifications off this uh, with the horse and the bat and the porpoise, and even with us, we have one bone, two bones, lots of bones, those are carpals and metacarpals, and then our digits, okay, which are phalanges. So this is all based upon our ancestral anatomy of the early amphibians, one bone, two bones, lots of bones, and digits. So, so this shows, uh, is an, uh, you know, modifications off of a previous plan that we all had and modified to different forms of locomotion. All right, let's look at vestigial organs. So a vestigial organ is a structure that is rudimentary and of marginal or no use to that organism. It's an indication of ancestry. And this is a really good example here uh, with vampire bats. Vampire bats, come up to organisms, they nick them with their large incisors, and they literally lick the blood of them. They don't need to chew anything, and that's what we use molars for, is to chew. They don't need those molars, but they still have them. And that is a vestigial organ uh, with these guys. Now with us, we have a few of these. One is our appendix. So our appendix is a, a remnant of a much larger cecum, which is a sac off our large intestine. If we look at organisms that eat a lot of plant matter, that cecum is very large, all right? And it's there to house bacteria to break down plant matter so they can get more energy from the plant matter that they eat. What happened with humans is our ancestors uh, went from a strictly uh, eating plants to eating plants and animals. And what happened there is that cecum reduced in size to what it is today, and that's what the appendix is a remnant of a much larger cecum. And now, all it can do is kill you, all right? Uh, next is a tailbone, uh, is another vestigial organ. Uh, pretty much all you can do is break that and, you know, cause you some pain. Uh, next is erector pili muscles. Erector pili muscles give us goosebumps. Goosebumps are used by other organisms to help them uh, retain more heat, uh, and it also makes them look bigger if they're startled. Uh, once again, those are both lost on us because of the reduction of hair that we have on our body surface. The reason that we have hair at all is to feel little creepy crawlies on us. Lastly here is a wisdom tooth. What has happened over time with the human uh, jaw, if I scroll back real quickly uh, to that picture, is that over time, when you look at this, as the cranium size enlarged, our faces flattened out over time. But the problem here is this guy had 32 teeth, and so did this one, and this one, and this one, and this one, and so do we. And so what happens here is now we don't have room for all those teeth. And so what can happen with people, because they don't have enough room for those teeth anymore, is they can come in sideways like uh, this unfortunate person. All right, and so our wisdom teeth are another example of a vestigial organ. Lastly is molecular biology. All organisms use the same basic biomolecules. We all use DNA as our genetic material. We all use RNA uh, to make proteins. We all use ATP for cellular energy. Uh, we all use the same genetic code, as I mentioned earlier this semester. And what we can see is when we look at the genes of organisms, the more uh, closely uh, those genes are to each other, what we find is they uh, have more similarities to, it, to each other. So humans share 90% of our genes with mice. And if you think, well, humans and mice don't look a lot alike, we have a lot in common. They produce hair, we produce hair, they have skin, we have skin, they have a digestive tract, we have a digestive tract, they're a placental mammal, we're a placental mammal, they produce milk, we produce milk, and so on. And so when you start to get to other organisms that have more, uh, that are more like, like us in appearance, 
Well, coincidentally enough, they also have a higher uh, amount of genes in common with us. So we get to chimpanzees, chimpanzees are like 98 and a half percent have the same genes as we do. So, and they are our closest relatives.